Hello, everyone. Welcome again to another edition of the latest Shiny podcast. Uh, we continue uh, with Rob Hirschfeld as our guest. And again, we have another guest speaker and uh, I guess guest podcaster, Pete uh, Miran from Epsara. Pete, welcome to the uh, podcast. Hey, thanks very much for having me today, guys. And uh, Rob, I think, I think Pete mentioned before this was his first podcast. I know it's not the Rocky Horror Picture Show, but we, we do Just have to figure to the left. <laughs> we have to figure out what we do to new podcasters. But uh, we make them think, sing, uh, sing, we make them sing the theme song. <laughs> so did you did you decide on a tune for the theme song? I think the last one I was looking at you you are listening to you were still trying to decide on a name for your logo bear. Uh, we that we that we it's it's uh, Claudia or right. Claudia. I keep I keep Claudia. Spending. I think it's Cla it's Claudia. It's Claudia. Spelled with cloud though. Yep. Yes. Per perfect. Um, perfect pun but, for a bear. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but no, we're still, that's, the theme song is still, you're off the hook on that. So. Yeah, I'm still, I, I owe a theme song for this podcast. We'll have to do something. Oh, I apologize for the dog. Docking bark, I, that would work for me. Yeah, the, do, the barking dog. Well, why don't I do this, Pete? I'll, real quickly, I'll go on mute. Can you go ahead and tell us a little about yourself and what you do? And then, you know, we can jump into some technology discussions. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, you know, as I was introduced, I'm Pete Miron. Uh, I am the general manager for the Nats team at Appsera. Uh, Appsera is a container management and orchestration company, uh, and the Nats team builds a high-performance, secure, super simple messaging system for for cloud-native ap applications. Uh, I've been working with the team for for about a year, um, and uh, you know, we're we're an open source project. Uh, and we actually just we just passed our 10 millionth uh, Docker pull, um, so we've got a, a fair bit of adoption and, and lots of really interesting users. So Nats is for intercommunication, right? Process, container, system intercommunications. This is sort of a very super high level thing, right? Do, do you feel like you displace? something like a RabbitMQ or just, just to give people an idea of where you would fit. Is, would, would we use Nats instead of Rabbit? Yeah, yeah. So um, for, for a lot of folks, you know, I think it, it fits most neatly in uh, the, the traditional message queue category. Uh, however, the, the, the base NAT server, the core NAT server, was designed to try to remove some of the uh, configuration complexity as well as uh, some of the the negative side effects of those traditional message uh, message brokers and messaging queues. So it, it it works really hard to make sure that you know we're handling um, slow consumers and we're we're providing very little, if any, back pressure um, to to publishers in the system and minimal latency for the messages that we're passing through. Uh, so the the core server doesn't have any durability built into it. So it's kind of fire and forget uh, pub sub as well as a standard kind of request reply pattern. And then for, we do have an add-on called NAT streaming and NAT streaming is where we add durability and uh, we'll sequence messages for you so that if you have a client that uh, misses a set of messages, they can go back and request them and we'll ensure at least once delivery. So this is huge in my mind because right, a lot of those other systems were built on the assumption that servers were durable, not using your word, Yep. Right. So I built something I needed to pass, you know, messages from server to server and those servers were long lived things. In this case, we're talking about something suited for containers that might live seconds, microseconds, you know, minutes. Yep. But the whole the whole way we're architecting applications assumes that my 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 joining of that network is a short lived thing. I'm in and out. Right. So that's yep. that's the NAS. How's that architecturally translate for you? You know, what, what impact did that have in the NAS design? Yeah, so... How, um, how was it impact? How was it changing? Yeah, so with, with the NAS design, uh, there, there are a couple of um, kind of really base, um, uh, really base decisions in the design early on. One was removing that durability, which removed a lot of dependencies for the NAT service itself. The other was uh, the clustering is full mesh. So essentially, you can add any new NAT server to a NATS cluster and it will automatically advertise itself as well as advertise all the subscriptions that any clients are looking for. So a, a client can subscribe to a topic 
uh, to any NAT server and all the other NAT servers in that cluster are aware of that of that subscription interest. So as that topology changes, both the, the servers and the clients that are connected to it, um, all of that, all that can be changed um, without having, you know, kind of reconfiguration and reprovisioning. Um, and just one, one kind of like simple example that I'd give you is in a lot of the systems I had built previously, there would be, you know, a, an Nginx or an Apache proxy that was forwarding requests into or between applications. Um, you know, your kind of standard RESTful application. Um, and in those, if you added new application servers, you needed to change your proxy configs uh, to allow for that. And with NATs, everything is connected directly to these centralized message brokers. So it allows for a much more hub and spoke kind of topology versus needing to have hard provision connections uh, and, and more of a stack topology. So there's a, a self-discovery component, um, and I'm, I'm assuming you, you really reduced the overhead for joining or then disappearing off of that, off of the network, right? So those, those hubs have to be able to handle a showed up that can't be expensive to join, and people, you know, uh, clients are going to disappear probably very frequently, right? Yeah, yeah, no, and, and the, the cost for, for those initial subscriptions and, and connections are small. The only, the only area where we've seen, um, we've seen some CPU is uh, we, we support TLS. So if you have tens of thousands of connections that are, you know, you've got a thundering herd sort of scenario um, coming back to the server, then that's going to take some time to, to process those TLS connections. Okay, that makes sense because that's there's the pretty expensive back and forth to share the keys. Yeah, you got that it. Perspective. That makes a lot of sense. And so, boy, there's so many places to go for this. Um, the first one to me is there's there's this uh, you know emerging in the container uh, container world service mesh concept, right? Where we're we're building a service mesh that does sounds like some similar things. It keeps track of where where services are running. It acts as a network. Well, the difference is that's acting as a network gateway and controlling inbound. And egress traffic, um, that's not, NATS isn't, isn't how, you know, compare NATS to a service mesh for me. I, so I'm a little confused. Yeah, yeah, no worries, no worries. So, uh, you know, I think a, a lot of, and, and this is, um, this is the use cases we're seeing for a lot of our users is they're treating them, treating it as this microservice communication bus. Um, we're payload agnostic, so they may actually be um, encoding their packets with, you know, Thrift or another common encoding or even JSON um, to, to send the mass messages back and forth uh, between, between their application servers. And I think with, with service meshes, you know, my, my understanding is with this kind of change um, in direction towards containers and container orchestration, things like IP addresses become you know, certainly more ephemeral, if not significantly less important. And what you really want to be sure of is if you've got a new application that's spinning up, that new application has some identity and needs to connect and talk to other applications, you want that to be configured externally to the applications themselves. And I view that it has to be, yeah. Right, right. There, there's, it, it, you know, we, we're, we're, all, um, we're all starting to get a much better idea of how important it is to make sure that... Uh, we're not just using these kind of um, the, the sort of firewall DMZ layer anymore, right? But it's really coming down to application to application security uh, and, and authorization for those applications to be able to talk to each other. And the service message meshes allow you to do that externally. Uh, we enable that as well. We have a authorization for, for your different subjects. Um, I think some of the, the newer service mes meshes like, uh, like an Istio are also coming, you know, kind of built in with dashboards and some other things for, uh, for kind of monitoring and measuring traffic uh, between right. endpoints as well. So, there, I mean, there's a huge performance management monitoring security component that comes in with this. And I, I, I want to talk to that in a, in a, in a, in a couple of questions. Um, it, it's still, to me, important sort of to think through if I'm running a containerized application and I'm publishing it with a service mesh, I'm making that, that, that application endpoint available as a service, like a RESTful endpoint and people are talking to me, um, that there's a degree of decoupling with that that's, that's positive because anybody could be consuming that service. 
which strikes me as, as, a, as a win. However, it can be expensive and it, it, it can be incredibly loosely coupled. You, your NATS is not loosely coupled, right? You're, you really have a relationship between the, the consumers in that, in that bus, right? Is that a fair difference? Uh, yeah, so the each consumer would be connected directly to the NAT server. We know um, we know the identity of that server. We can, you know, handle um, TLS, both certificate authentication, uh, client authentication, as well as server side. Right. And so, it's so my, we can really and it's, know. Sorry, and it's more bidirectional. So if I'm if I have a relationship going on with another service, shifting it to NATs means that I really have a, an interconnect. Whereas an, an Istio service is going to be something that's much more of a, here's a RESTful request, give me an object, and then I don't know if they're coming back or not. Is that fair? Okay. It's, this stuff is so confusing. It's, it's nice to dig in a little bit and have, have people you know, be able to, to hear like, oh, okay, I, that's not going to solve all my problems. <laughs> yeah, well, it, you know, I think it... Uh, there, there's there's been such a such a change with um, with a lot of these container orchestration and con container management systems. You know, if you look at things like like Kubernetes, um, you know, I think there you used to essentially just have maybe some firewall rules on the host, maybe firewalls uh, external for the overall network. Obviously, you've got your network and route topology um, separating machines, but it was it was so much more coarse grained and so much longer lived. Than it is today, and it's so much more is shifting to kind of application level uh, configuration and definition of these applications for talking to each other. So I, I think there's there's just a lot moving in this space right now. Um, I think ultimately it's it's all positive movement, um, but it's definitely a very different way of thinking about the world than you know IP address ranges and port numbers. Yeah, that it, we have to have some way to have services and relationships between things. What what about on the, the bottom side? So I know like some you know, Kubernetes is a good example. They use at, at CD to handle some of this inter-process communication where they have shared data and then they use locks. Um, and at CD is not just a data store, it's actually a synchronization piece, right? Where, where they, they're aware of changes that are being made across the infrastructure. Do you, do you see that as blended in the NATS ecosystem and, and stack or how do those fit together? So, so some people will use us for service discovery. Uh, you know, so essentially if you publish or subscribe to, um, you know, slash, um, slash orders or something along those lines, right? So, uh, so that you don't need to know everything that's processing. Um, and actually, let me, let me take a step back here. Um, so, as part of what NATS supports, it supports this concept of a, dis a distributed queue. And we automatically handle the load balancing uh, randomly against all the clients of that queue. So people will kind of send a message to, to their NAT server, and then there's some number of clients on the other end that have subscribed to be able to reply to that service. So some people will use us for, uh, for that service discovery, right? So they don't, they don't need to know um, exactly what version of a service or what service is going to be processing their messages. They just need to know that there was a service that could connect and was authorized to process that message. Um, but obviously, you know, etcd, I think, um, is a is obviously a much more robust uh, kind of service discovery and um, kind of key value pair store. Uh, we don't, because we don't store uh, things like last values or most recent values, and we don't have an easy, simple lookup for that, even in our net streaming, um, we're, we're just not as efficient if you're, if you're doing a lot of key value storage inside of the NAT server. Makes sense. Yeah, and this is one of those, those classic places where, you know, there's, there's some really interesting blending where you can sort of get through, you know, you might be able to use <laughs> a key value store or service discovery. Uh, I think at console, uh, at one point we were looking through, um, we were looking through using NATS and because it's in Golang, just embedding it into our software. So the client was part of the, the message passing pieces. And that was a, a really nice use case for it instead of using console as a way to sort of synchronize objects. Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, there is a degree of, of, you can get away with things like that for a little while, but at one point, at some point you're going to wake up and say, Oh, I don't want to use raft to synchronize my, <laughs> My data, my objects when I'm really trying to pass messages around. 
Oh. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, you've, I'm sure you've, you've edited your Etsy hosts file before, right? And it's that, that, that same kind of idea, right? Where you can do it, but then there's a point where um, you're just like, you know what, I need to set up the DNS infrastructure. Right. And, and so it's important to understand how these tools fit together and where they get used. And you can pull them into, you know, interesting roles. Like the same thing with service mesh. I could use my service mesh to send messages around. And, but pretty soon I'm going to exhaust the HTTP, um, you know, restful model and I'm going to start doing bad things from a rest perspective. We don't want to do that either. So, uh, you know, it's, I love the, that we've been able to sort of dissect, here's a, here's a spectrum of things that you're going to use in a, in a container architecture, fine tune a little bit about, all right, I need to think through the NATS pieces. You want to talk about security and, and where security plays in and, and I always love to hear the train wrecks, the security train wrecks too. <laughs> where, where does it fit in? Where doesn't it? Yeah, so for security for us uh, right now is we have um, kind of auth standard authorization and authentication files. Um, you know, we we are uh, we use TLS for for all of our security, and and our goal has really just been to try to keep our security story pretty simple. Um, so we've got separate TLS support both for your clients and for the communication that happens between the NAT servers. Um, and, you know, really just trying to make sure that we can both handle endpoint encryption. Uh, what we don't have at this point and that we've had quite a few people ask us about is uh, third party authorization and authentication um, system connections. But the way we've built and designed and the, the, the um, dependency goals that we've had so far with NATS, that hasn't really bubbled to the top of our priority list yet. So we recommend people kind of generate their authorization and authentication files once they get up to that scale. Um, versus having a, a connection into, you know, an active directory or something similar at this point. That, that strikes me as a service um, in what you're describing, right? It would sort of be a, you, you would, because you don't want to inject <laughs> any overhead into these, these communication channels. You're trying to get them to be lightweight. So it's it, sort of exactly. A, yeah. Um, yeah, that makes, that makes sense. We do a lot of token type generation stuff for us. So you generate a token and then the tokens, you're off to the races with the token. Yeah, yeah, no, and it, you know, for for every one of those, even like the token generation, right? You're already spending so much time in the that TLS negotiation. You know, I just I, I think keeping it as dead simple as possible and not having to worry about you know if you do do authentication to some external system, how long do you cache it for? How do you handle cache invalidation? Those are those are all you know very hard problems that can have a wide a pretty wide degree of impact depending on your customers. Right. So let's, uh, there, uh, I want to, there's, there's politics. I want to, uh, <laughs> open source politics, not, not you know, <laughs> I, no, corporate. No, that's, that's a Mark special. Um, I know. I was going to say, I, I, I sort of felt bad that we didn't start out as, um, as deeply as the podcast. With, uh, <laughs> uh, oh, that was an awesome, I love that start. Um, yeah, Mark and I know each other really, really well. As you and I get to spend some some time over beers and 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 things like that, I, I would love to have a have a similar conversation. For people who don't know the reference, Mark and I started off. This was right after the Las Vegas shooting and the Harvey Weinstein um, atrocities. Um, both the on both of them are, are just exposing the saddest parts of, of humanity, and we we discussed that at the beginning of the podcast. Um, yeah, Pete. If if you want to make a statement, I'd I'd love to hear it. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, but I won't I'm, put you on the spot either. Uh, yeah, well, no. I this, thought, uh, well, sorry, I, Rob Peter. I thought we were going to talk and complain about OpenStack and how. Uh, oh, not OpenStack. Excuse me. I thought we were going <laughs> to complain and talk about open source and all the evils in open source and how no one ever listens to us, people that have been around open source a long time. And if they would, life would be better. <laughs> I was going to get there when I asked Pete about CNCF. But I'm, I'm holding that question a little bit because because I'm, I'm trying to be geeky and talk on the tech side first, but we can we can jump. Um, you know, I, so, yeah, I, I was going to say on the, the kind of deep news story stuff, I'm just I'm, this is one of the few times I'm glad that the news cycle moves so fast because now it's I mean, that stuff all pretty much happened ages ago. You know, nobody nobody even remembers it anymore. It's we need to keep it top of mind, um, yes. especially the, you know, the, the, 
none of this is new, and that's that's what makes me sad when I when I talk, the Harvey Weinstein stuff. And then we, um, this will be a couple weeks later. You know, this will go out a couple weeks later. But um, this isn't new. It shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. We need to fix it. Um, and so I, I I I get very sad when when people are, are like, oh, I'm just can't believe it's this much of a problem. Yeah. Well, that that's. Um... I mean, I don't want to spend too much time on it either, but the, you know, I think earlier this week with some of the, the Scoble stuff that came out, right. So it's, it's clearly hitting on every industry and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm sort of shocked at the, the kind of level of excuses that folks are making for themselves in these situations. I mean, it's just, yeah, I, I don't, I don't have a, I don't have a good, easy solution um, you know, I think um, I'm glad that there are um, starting to be so many more places to amplify um, amplify the messages of these women who are coming forward. Um, I just think it's so. I think it's it's bad how we're still clearly responding negatively. The the way that I started understanding this and and other discriminatory issues um, where where we've we've suppressed diversity is you have to own that you are part of the system. You have to get over the, well, no, of course I don't. Right. You do. Every, every person is part of the system that has benefited from, you know, in, in Harvey Weinstein's case, being able to take advantage of women and power. Right. Um, and you could substitute whatever minority, whatever power differential you want. But every, every person, especially uh, privileged white males have, been in advantage of that. And the sooner you just say yes, see now I'm back on my soapbox. As soon as yeah. you acknowledge that, then you can get, you can say, yes, I am at fault. Even if you didn't do it personally, you are, you, you, you have responsibility. And then we can talk about it. Then we can fix it. Yeah. Start, start moving forward. And, and there was actually, um, my wife was reading a quote. I, I don't want to, I don't want to misquote it. So you, you should definitely pull this if I'm wrong but I think it was the owner of the Houston Texans who made some quote about, um, about how we can't let the inmates run the asylum regarding the, the kneeling. And it's like, like how, like how could you have like a better kind of more clear uh, statement of the problem than the, you know, privileged white male owner of Houston Texans saying that about his players and his team. So, Peter, it is not uh, – that is the exact quote, <laughs> and it just came out an hour ago. And believe me, uh, the, uh, the response is quite impressive. <laughs> so yeah. it's, it, he's yeah. under attack. Well, it just shows you. It's a sh it, it, I guess it is what it is, but it shows you that, how these people really think. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's like I, it, it just seemed like such a clear articulation of the problem. And it's it's funny that he almost certainly doesn't get that irony. And I love that we just had this conversation. <laughs> this is this right. This is this. You know, we're, we we do cool tech. We get excited about this stuff. The reality is, we can't walk away from these this conversation and owning it because we'd rather talk about you know Go Lang and containers and things like that. They're not disconnected. And so thank you. No, I, so, so uh, as much as I, I dreaded where this was going, uh, I think you're absolutely right. And uh, I, I appreciate you, you guys kind of driving these types of conversations. Thanks. Thank you. Our pleasure. It, we care very passionately about it. It's one of the reasons why we started with Mark on, on this, Mark Tealy, and, and, and we just went, you know, we, he and I, know each other deep enough we just go straight in and we both own it um cool and that let's go back to the shiny <laughs> now to, on, on to on the cloud native <laughs> so well I, I would actually like to talk about edge a little bit first so before we before we dive in there um we'll keep the cloud native as a teaser um edge you know we we talk about edge on the uh, podcast a bit um and Edge is really hard. Um, it has different neat use cases. Networking is, is much more intensive in, in, in an Edge case. And, and people are going to shoot up, what, what is Edge? I don't, I don't care. I really don't care. Edge is what's not cloud. If you're not running in a big public cloud, you are on the Edge. Yes. That is my definition now. Right. Um, 
it's it's in your hand it's the laptop you're using it's the tablet you're using it's you know some cell tower base station somewhere it's all that stuff it, it, i'm i've been starting to go so far as to say it is the enterprise data center because that is much an edge yep. <laughs> and as, as a cell tower or a factory or a retail outlet or a coffee shop it, it's all edge so nats to me has some really interesting capabilities from that sort of distributed, not cloud scenario. Can you, can you explain how NAS would help you there or where it would work, where not, where it wouldn't work too? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. So, you know, I think, um, and th this was actually, um, you know, we, we started offering a, a software as a service product called NAS Cloud um, about five months ago. And the, the whole, you know, my, my personal hypothesis about this is that, um, all the data will be moving to not just a cloud, um, you know, and I, I, I'm, I'm reasonably confident that you're, you're sympathetic to this argument. Uh, but, you know, from what, what I'm seeing in the cloud development, if we look back three years ago, there was a cloud, there was AWS, right? That was the only cloud that mattered. Right. And now we're finally to the point where there are multiple clouds and those multiple clouds um, don't just provide the potential for, price or performance improvements over each other, but they're actually starting to offer differentiated services. You know, whether that differentiated services geography or, you know, you look at things like the Cosmos database and, and Azure or, you know, some of their new um, kind of Kubernetes as a service and container uh, management or, you know, same thing on the Google side versus, you know, AWS, which is the obvious behemoth in the space. So my, my assertion has been that um, more and more people are going to be looking to move data across more of these clouds and use services across those clouds. And they're going to want some way to securely transfer messages, whether that's streams of sensor data or service request reply, uh, that they're going to want a way to, to handle that securely. So what we've offered with Nats Cloud has been um, these secure TLS-based services that we're running for you um, that you can actually cluster across multiple clouds um, to allow you to run your services in whichever cloud is kind of most convenient for you. Um, so it can either be across regions, across availability zones, or across entire clouds. But the idea with the edge is, um, you know, you, you basically, you bring your client, NATS client libraries are all small, simple. We've got ones in pretty much every language, major language, as well as many of the non-major languages. Um, but so you can connect, you can connect securely. And because we're such a lightweight footprint in our messaging, uh, it's, it's not taking up a lot of bandwidth. Um, you know, we just, it's funny, we just had a, um, this um, gentleman that we've been working with, Alex Ellis, uh, he's got this project called Open FAS, Open F-A-A-S, Functions as a Service. And uh, he just released a, he's working on a demo now for Raspberry Pis doing serverless uh, and using NATS underneath. And, you know, I think you're going to just see more of these kind of like both sensors as well as like, hey, I need, I need to know how to do this thing. I need this information. Go out to the internet and get it. Uh, and I think, you know, we provide at least a, an encrypted um, point to point messaging between you, anything on the edge, right? Any service that you're running on the edge. Um, back to your clouds, and then if you want uh, applications running in the cloud to consume those messages, right? Whether that's for data processing or for um, actually replying to requests, you can run that in the in the cloud of your choice. You can connect it to the cloud service of your choice. So you you hit a theme that we've had. Um, we definitely talked about um, in uh, some other podcasts with Brenna Golden and Eves um, from Ericsson, where. You, you're, you're building an application. You need, your, your, you, you need to connect to other things to make that application work, right? That's fundamentally what we're talking about. I need data, I need to share data, I need to report data, I need, I need some help making a decision. I, it doesn't matter. That's, NATS will give you a, a, a lightweight client to connect to some, some other service. And then where that service is located is going to be fluid. Yes. It, you might start off on day one putting it in the data center, or in, in, sorry, in the cloud, because the cloud is convenient and that's where you're running this big analytics engine or something like that. And then you're like, ah, the latency on this sucks or I'm not scaling it well. And then you want to take that work and bring it closer to an edge where you're like, oh, okay, this component of my service 
it, I need to be able to decouple it from the location it's in and move it closer, or it, it, the egress, you know, the cost of sending the data across the pipeline is killing me. I need to put it in the factory close to my you know, manufacturing center where I'm generating all this. But that portability, what you're doing is you're enabling that portability. Um, yeah, and I, I think but, you know, I'll pause. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I was going to say, and I think I think the important, um, you know, regardless of what what service you use, I think it's important for architects who are designing systems today to build in those hinge points so that they're able to transfer that data. They're able to make use of those other utilities. Um, I was talking to somebody yesterday who, you know, recently switched from um, from running their own Elasticsearch clusters to moving to SignalFX as an example, right? And right now, all of these kind of data, um, every time we're, we're looking at making any changes in those services underneath, we have to go and run new agents on all of our, all of our boxes. Um, you know, unfortunately, all these don't use like the old standard stuff that's been around for 30 or 40 years, right? Um, but uh, but so like my my hope is we can get to this point where things are a bit more standardized so that you can decide you know who do you want to run your analytics you know if if uh, Google has a a neat new TensorFlow package that they're offering inside of their cloud you know you should be able to start siphoning some of your data off over there uh, and seeing you know if its predictions are better than you know the models that you're currently running on your Amazon GPUs and this to me is where NATS or you know, any, any, message, any messaging protocol provides you with that abstraction layer. Yeah. Um, and, and it's a critical architectural piece when we look at edge, um, which, and I don't think edge is, should be that radically, radically different architectural drive, right? Where a lot of the microservices architectures already, drive, already require this, or they, they would, would get you if you, were, if you were thinking down the road that you would, you would be putting in these abstraction layers uh, the nice thing about the, the messaging pattern is that it's a very connected pattern. So you're not relying on a, a restful endpoint somewhere, um, which can have a lot of overhead. This is, you know, I've got this, this closed loop stream of data. I get acts back. I know exactly uh, acknowledgements back. Um, you know, that's, that type of, of system allows you to be very durable and decoupled, right? Yeah. Sort of without being completely decoupled. It's nice. It's a nice mix. Um, all right. So I want to save a little bit of time to to talk to talk open source politics. Uh, <laughs> CNCF, um, who uh, I was on the OpenStack board for a while, which is uh, ends up being you know OpenStack is a very sort of controlled environment with a lot of oversight. CNCF is uh, it's it's more like a a, 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 a tailgate party to me. Um, <laughs> And I, I'm sure Chris and Dan love that analogy, um, but it is. I, I think it's a great analogy. I love that. So uh, Nats is. I'll let you. I'll let you line up. What's your relationship with CNCF? Yeah, so um, with CNCF, um, AppSera is on the board and is a um, is a member. I unfortunately forget our membership level off the top of my head. Um, Super but, spectacular. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want to say silver, maybe. Um, yeah. So, you know, some, something that's not the, the super platinum of, uh, of all of the giant tech gods. Right. Um, Racken's a member too, but they handed us a broom when we joined. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I sense that Derek was kind of very early in, in all the discussions. Yes, yes he was. Um, but, uh, uh, and just to uh, fill in the rest of the audience, Derek is the, Derek Collison is the CEO of AppSera. Um, but so, uh, for, for the Nats project, uh, we've recently um, done an informal presentation to the um, to the technical committee at uh, at CNCF, and we've gotten the approval to submit for um, to submit our project to the CNCF for um, for governance. Um, and I think to your to your point about the, the tailgate, the tailgate analogy is not actually a bad analogy. Um, you know, I think the the CNCF is really providing the the place for these projects to, um, you know, help them with with bits of PR promotion, offer some some documentation, some technical oversight. But the it's really still being left to the teams themselves, which is you know one of the things that was was very interesting for me. 
uh, as we were as we were kind of weighing whether or not it was the right thing to do for Nats. Um, you know, I think there's there's becoming this this big community of really great projects. You know, I think the CNCF's crown jewel is clearly Kubernetes. Um, the brisket uh, smoker is the way I would have described it. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> That's, I'm sorry. I didn't, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't need to move away from the tailgate analogy. <laughs> I'm all in. I'm all in. That's right. That's right. Uh, is it well? I mean, it's it really depends on your your preferred kind of upscale uh, tailgate fare, right? So but to some people, it's a brisket smoker. To other people, it's the the shrimp tray, right? But uh, yeah, very, I, I need yeah. to actually no, I'm, I'm in Austin, so brisket you can't. Oh, you're brisket, right, you're right. Totally no no. And, and I'm actually drooling on my microphone right now. <laughs> um, uh, you got to come down. Actually, CNCF is in Austin uh, in de early December, so December, I, I plan on brisket being served. Yes, I, I plan on being there. Um, yeah. So, uh, so yeah. So I think I think I've from what I've seen over the last few months, uh, you know, and you look at this kind of meteor growth that that Kubernetes has had, and that you know, I think tools like Prometheus have had as well. Um, that it, it's it's not a bad tailgate party to be a part of or to aspire to be a part of. Uh, I think it, it gets you talking with the the right other set of people. It gets you um, kind of looked at or your project looked at for the right set of integrations. Um, that you know from from right now. I mean they they've managed to secure just about every major technology major large technology company. Uh, as a member of the CNCF, you know, I, if you asked me three or four months ago, or I guess it's been at least that long, uh, if, if Amazon would ever, would ever join, you know, I, I kind of initially viewed it as like, a, you know, the, the, the people, the gang kind of ganging up on, you know, how do we defeat the behemoth that is Amazon in that space? And the fact that Amazon's there, that Oracle's there, I mean, it really is everybody, Microsoft, right? Microsoft yeah. So this is something that, you know, OpenStack was always a vendor. You know, they had some, some users and big like AT&T, but it was, it was very, you know, vendors were driving it. Um, in this case, the cloud, the cloud providers all seem to have been, jumped in. I, they're not exactly vendors, but they're sort of vendors. And then... Um, um, they're, they're, clearly, they're, they're clearly the beneficiaries of this technology, right? As an on-ramp into their clouds. In, in our in our um, tailgate analogy, they are the big game that everybody's in the parking lot for. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, sports ball stuff. It's it's something <laughs> hockey. I don't know. It's something that they're lined up for. But um, <laughs> or, or who knows? Maybe we're going to see the Stones, right? Like <laughs> it's it's a concert. Yes, exactly. So they're right. We're at this. It, you know, and that's yeah. I love it. That's perfect. Um, I don't even want to think who's who's doing the dead show on this one, but right. um, there are loyal followings. Um, so, oh boy, we've tortured this analogy really far. Um, hey man, I'm then, right here with you. I'm right here with you. <laughs> and, and Cloud Foundry, um, to their credit, have been really good at pulling in the actual users of their tech as their founding members. Um, and so I think there's there's going to be an interesting reckoning as we, we look at foundations and see, you know, who, what, what model is really, is really driving, right? The beneficiaries, the, the vendors, or the, the users. Um, well, so, so that's, that's been kind of the, the other thing that I think it was important for me when looking at the CNCF is that the, the vendors don't really have any say in the in the projects themselves, right? So they're all kind of contributing. They're all contributing to the the CNCF itself. But each of the projects gets to set their own governance model, right? Which I think which I think is smart. And and what I like um, is that they aren't while they're all in the orbit around Kubernetes, they aren't beholden to Kubernetes. They're not they're not measured or judged by their integrations with Kubernetes. It's, it's not like uh, OpenStack's Big Ten thing where sort of this, everybody was navel gazing back to OpenStack's central projects. It, it actually feels like they're all, I mean, that's why Tailgate is, is great, right? You, you, know, you show up at Tailgate with your friends and if, if you go over to get the brisket, that's great, everybody's excited. But if you don't, well, you, you know, that's okay. <laughs> Right, the, shrimp, the shrimp platter that, that Nats is serving up is, is pretty tasty and, and I'm, you know, you can gorge on the shrimp. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. 
right. yeah, I'd like to comment that it's lunchtime as this being recorded. <laughs> it's, it's people all, never know these things. Yeah, for, for as a service. Uh, for, <laughs> For for those of us on the East Coast, we were uh, we were happy to to eat lunch beforehand. So apology <laughs> that you guys are, are really drooling. <laughs> oh, that's funny. So Stephen, I'm assuming you're 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 coming in to to break up the party. Yeah, I think this may be our longest podcast yet. Every time I think, well, 20, 30 minutes, boom, we're pushing. I mean, we're going to be pushing towards an hour soon, Rob. So I don't this know. Is, this, is a, this is really three podcasts. <laughs> Multiple podcasts. I think, I think we'll but, certainly, Pete, we're going to need to bring you in again. There, there's no doubt about it. And, uh, <laughs> I, I think the technical content in the first half of this podcast was outstanding. And uh, I, you know, I'm really pleased. We try to get content for all levels of listeners. Uh, Rob, any last things before I uh, we are force you to close this? I know. No, let's know close, let's close it and have Pete tell us where he's going to be and, and how to get in touch with him. Yeah. Yeah, sure thing. So you can find me on Twitter at Pete Miron, last name's M-I-R-O-N, uh, and check out Nats at Nats.io. Um, download it, play around with it, and let us know what you think. Awesome. Great. Thank you. Well, hey, thank you so much. And I have to say for someone who claimed to have never done a podcast before, you are a professional. Yes, and uh, you're, you're, you're as good as they come. We might, you might as well start your own podcast channel. <laughs> we, can, we can let you know how, how it is to try to do one podcast a week. It keeps, yeah. you, very, it keeps oh. you very busy. And uh, well, thanks to both of you. And uh, to our listeners, uh, thanks for joining us. And stay tuned. Uh, more podcasts will be coming soon.